Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a good conference so far. Um, this is a talk about booting Linux kernel into a higher privilege level. I'm Anatri Kalinou. I have been with Microsoft for uh, two years now, um, and I've been working on pretty much this project. And before that, I was with Intel for about seven years, working on um, things like uh, side channel attacks and uh, confidential computing. And with me, I have my uh, manager and <laughs> project lead, Tara. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Tara. Uh, I have been with Microsoft for the last two years. And I primarily have been working on this. And I lead this project at Microsoft, the Linux virtualization-based security project. And prior to that, I have worked on Linux power management frameworks and thermal management frameworks in the embedded space, basically. So prior to Microsoft, everything was an embedded, yeah. OK, awesome. So let's, let's start. Um, today, we are going to have a sort of introduction and motivation about the architecture that we have uh, built. And then we are going to have a deep dive into booting primary CPUs, booting secondary CPUs in that environment, and then lastly, secure boot. So everything that you wanted to know about booting and you were too afraid to ask, <laughs> today you're going to learn. <laughs> Okay, so um, our project is uh, called LVBS. It stands for Linux Virtualization Based Security. Um, this is inspired by Windows VBS or Windows Virtualization Based Security, which has been around for uh, a few years now. Um, the goal with a VBS is to be able to protect the kernel. Um, and in order to do that, uh, we are leveraging the hypervisor security boundary. So the kernel has always been an attractive uh, target for attacks. And during the last few years, we have seen them um, grow. Uh, the CVs that were reported for the kernel have um, increased uh, year over year. So um, our goal is to try to protect the kernel. But in order to do that, uh, we want to be outside of it in another environment, if that makes sense. Because if the kernel is, um, is attacked and there is a, um, a CV that is exploited, it means that the, kernel, that the attacker has access to that kernel. So whatever uh, protection that we have over there, it can be just disabled if the attacker has kernel privileges, right? <laughs> so, that is where we are utilizing the hypervisor in order to apply those protections. So our goal with LVBS is to protect the integrity of security critical guest structures, even if the kernel gets compromised. So even if there is an attack and the kernel becomes compromised, we want to make sure that critical resources like the text section or read-only data or keys or any secret that we have in the kernel mean, remains protected and not compromised. Um, yeah, so the other one is to, we are utilizing, the, the kernel already has a lot of self-protection mechanisms, but again, if it becomes compromised, the attacker can just disable them. So our goal is to be able to prevent that from happening. Um, so even if it becomes compromised, we make sure that those protections remain in place. And finally, we want to support a trusted execution environment for running security applications. Uh, this is a secondary goal, even though it's, it is important. Um, our current implementation doesn't have it yet, but we want to add it in the future. Okay, so this talk will focus on Hyper-V specifically. However, the LVBS architecture is hypervisor agnostic, and we try to do that as much as possible. Um, we do have a KVM implementation that is done by um, our team, and there is actually an RFC for that, and a couple of talks that talk about this. So if you are interested, um, please check it out. Um, the, uh, we are, our solution works with uh, x64 processor, and it's working for both AMD and Intel. And the only hardware requirement that we have for this architecture is that we want support for uh, second level access, um, uh, second level uh, address tables or EPTs, extended page tables, depending on if you are AMD or Intel, 
and uh, MBEC uh, support. MBEC stands for Mode-Based Execution Control. I had to Google that. <laughs> um, but it basically spits, splits the um, execution permission into user execute and kernel execute. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how the architecture looks like for a Hyper-V based system without LVBS, just right out of the box. Um, we have hardware and Hyper-V on the lowest level. Hyper-V is running as ring minus one. And then we have the guest partition and root partition that run on top of it. Uh, if you're running, if you are, uh, uh, running a VM, the only thing that you're going to see is the guest partition, which has its own kernel and user space. Uh, VSM or virtual secure mode, the, the technology that we are taking advantage of with LVBS introduced something that is called virtual trust levels or VTLs. And those create a separate privileged execution environment within a partition. So focusing more, mostly on the guest partition because that's where we are gonna talk about, um, we have VTL zero and VTL one. Um, VTLs or virtual trust levels are hierarchical, meaning that higher VTLs are more privileged than lower VTLs. So in our case, VTL zero is the least privileged um, <coughs> level, and this is where the guest uh, will run. So the guest kernel and the guest user space is in VTL zero. VTL one is what we are using for our security environment that will um, implement the protections that we have for the guest for VTL zero. Um, architecturally, VSM uh, supports up to 16 levels, but we are only focused, we only care about two for now, just VTL0 and VTL1. Just a reminder, VTL0 is the guest, VTL1 is the um, security kernel and security user space. Um, the VSM features that um, Hyper-V provides and also are applicable to our architecture um, I have tried to summarize here, but um, if you want to know more, there is um, a link. There's a lot of documentation about VSM online. But in a nutshell, um, VSM provi provides um, state isolation, meaning that each virtual processor maintains a separate per VTL state. So given that we have a virtual processor, if that uh, VP transfers from VTL0 to say VTL1, then that VP will have to store the private registers for VTL0 and restore the previously saved registers for VTL1. There is shared registers, but there are also most of them, uh, but there are also private as well. Next is that there is memory access uh, hierarchy and protection. So each VTL inside a single partition will share the same guest physical memory space. So each VTL will see the same guest memory. However, um, higher level VTLs can impose memory restrictions to lower VTLs. And that's something that we, we utilize because for example, we have VTL one that's is running the secure, the secure kernel. We don't want VTL zero to be able to access that. And that's how we, how we apply protections. We also apply protections for the memory within VTL zero. Um, but that's a feature that um, VSM gives us. Those memory protections are implemented by the hypervisor in the second level page tables. So ultimately, in order for, let's say, VTL zero to access um, uh, a memory address, it will have to comply both with the permissions that exist in the VTL zero uh, guest page tables and the, the permissions that are in EPT and whatever VTL one imposes as additional permissions. So the, the actual access will have to comply with all of this. If something fails, then the access will not go through. Finally, uh, there is a virtual interrupt and intercept um, handling. And each VTL, VTL has its own interrupt subsystem so that that ensures that higher VTLs can process interrupts without interference 
from lower VTLs. Again, because we have a hierarchy, we want to make sure that uh, the higher VTL processes the interrupt and cannot be, let's say, bypassed uh, from a lower level uh, VTL. Okay, uh, next, let's talk about how do we do the transitions between different VTLs. There are two ways to do that. One is uh, via an explicit VTL call and VTL return. When I say VTL call and VTL return, it's basically um, a hyper call that VTL0 kernel has to do. So it jumps into the Hyper-V hypervisor and the hypervisor goes to the appropriate VTL in order to handle the call. Um, we use the registers for uh, passing the opcode or what this VTL call is about. And then we have some other registers for parameters. The second way to do the transition between VTLs is asynchronous. And that is based on um, an interrupt. And as I said, higher VTLs get precedence over low VTLs. Um, keep in note that um, the goal is for us that VTL0 is going to run 99% of the time because as a guest, we want to make sure that the guest is the one that is running in the CPU. VTL1 is only run if there is an explicit VTL call to, let's say, do a memory protection or um, if there is an interrupt. But mostly it will be just VTL0 running in that in every VP. Okay, and here is how our system looks like. Um, on the upper left side, we have the guest Linux kernel that is running in VTL0, as I said. And the green and purple things are the, the new things that we have added. <laughs> um, in the guest Linux kernel, we have the VSM boot driver, which we are going to dive to today um, a lot deeper <laughs> and see how it works. It's basically responsible for booting um, everything in VTL1, the bootloader, the kernel, everything there. Um, the VSM driver is mostly to um, apply protections uh, for uh, VTL0. We have the memory protection framework as well and the exception handler. Those are with different color because those components are also shared with, um, with KVM or any other hypervisor that we are, we are able to use in the future. The memory protection framework is responsible for tracking um, the protections that we want for the VTL0 um, memory space. And the exception handler is just to make sure that whenever there's an exception, we have a way to handle it, <laughs> basically. Um, VTL1 on the other side contains a minimal bootloader, which um, its only purpose in life is just to bring the uh, VTL1 secure kernel um, up and running. There we have the VSM driver, which handles the VTL calls, interrupt and intercept handler, uh, memory protection, which is what communicates with Hyper-V in order to apply the memory protections. And finally, we have the VSM user interface, which is for um, trustlet uh, that are going to be run in VTL1 user space. That is not implemented as of yet, but it's going to be in the future. So, Spoiler alert, I have it here. Uh, I do have security, secure Linux kernel as a VTL1 kernel, um, but it's, we evaluated multiple options before we landed into that. Um, and the requirements that we had for choosing the kernels for VTL1 were that we want the smallest possible um, TCB, we want to be simple, um, and we wanted to be able to have uh, to be easily maintainable. Uh, we wanted to have a uh, low interface and low jitters because, as I said, we want VTL0 to be running in every VP for 99% of the time. And we want to have a, a small and secure interface between VTL0 and VTL1. So a way to do the, that communication and shared uh, resources between the two levels. Here are the options that we had when we were considering which kernel to use. 
um, Opti was actually a really um, close choice. Um, we have an implementation that is actually using uh, Opti instead of the, the, the minimal Linux kernel that we eventually picked. The reason that we, we moved away out of Opti is because there is no um, mainline exist for uh, support. There is one in the private branch, but we wanted to make sure that it's going to be maintainable. Um, and the second disadvantage of Opti is that there is no mainline implementation for SMP or booting in every um, with multiple processors. And this is something that was a requirement for us because we want to make sure that we um, protect, uh, for example, control registers on every VP. And that wouldn't be possible if we had VTL1 only running in one. Um, so with that, I will leave Tara to talk about the rest. Yeah, hello. So we said we'll talk about boot. We'll talk about boot. Uh, so first, what are we going to boot? We just said we want to boot a minimal Linux kernel in VTL1, in a secure partition, in a privileged partition. Uh, we are talking about, uh, as far as the system is concerned, we have a guest kernel running in VTL0, and we want to bring up the secure kernel in VTL1, and it's a, it's a privileged level. Uh, so first thing we did is we really want a small kernel. At this point in our project, we are really not, we don't even want user space really running. We only want to implement kernel protections, memory protections, register protections, and get some interrupts and intercepts in case of violation. So we don't really even care about user space. So we compiled out most of the drivers, like network drivers, file systems, things like that. Um, we decided to use an uncompressed kernel, which is just the plain vanilla VM Linux so that we don't have to deal with compressing and de uh, uncompressing and things like that. Today, the size is 7.3 megabytes, but I think we can do better. We haven't really dug deep into uh, compiling out the kernel or making it as small as possible and removing all the features. But today, this is what we are at. Uh, and then the next question is, okay, now that we have this kernel, we have built this kernel, who actually boots this kernel? There is a guest kernel already running in VTL0, and um, which gets actually booted by the UEFI boot loader or any other bootloader that you use. So who will actually go ahead and boot the, v the kernel that will run in VTL1? Um, again, we could have gone with a UEFI bootloader booting it or saying that even hypervisor can boot it. Uh, we decided to say that we decided to say that the kernel running in VTL0 itself will go ahead and boot the secure kernel, establish all the required security premises and policies before that kernel jumps into the user land. That is what we decided on here. Primarily because we wanted the solution to be ported across OSs, as in if today I'm using a Ubuntu OS or I use Azure Linux OS I, or VM, I should be able to use the solution without doing any bootloader modification or depending on hypervisor. So this works in, in that case. And that brings us to the boot.c driver that Anna showed you in the diagram, uh, which we, it's, a custom, it's a driver we wrote and we plan to upstream it, which actually does this process of uh, bringing up the uh, minimal Linux kernel in the secure world. Before we start, so this is how the st entry point of an uncompressed kernel looks like in Linux. Uh, I don't know, I hope this is legible there, but yeah. Uh, so the important thing I wanted to talk about here is that the entry to Linux kernel, a Linux kernel expects uh, some data or a boot structure to be passed from any bootloader, from any of the bootloader. It needs some kind of information on, let's say, things like uh, the physical memory structure of the system. Uh, if there are devices in the system, maybe on how some devices can be brought up, um, on information on number of CPUs in the system, things like that. Uh, that is mandatory, right? And we cannot boot Linux kernel without passing that structure. And so th this is the structure. So that's called boot params in kernel. We do not dig deep into it today, but it is defined in that uh, header file. It's a 4K structure. It's called zero page. Uh, it also has things like, like I said, the E820 memory layout, the kernel command line that can be appended into the built-in command line, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And we want to pass this. 
So what we did for this is to actually write a small minimal bootloader that will run in VTL1 prior to this minimal Linux kernel. Uh, which again meant that we can avoid having secure kernel specific code. We can say that, okay, VT, the whole boot structure can be defined in the memory and passed from the VTL0 guest kernel into the secure kernel. But that would mean that the guest kernel will become will be aware of the structure of a secure kernel. I mean, we didn't want it. If tomorrow we decide to change the secure kernel from Linux to, again, back to Opti, we wanted the same driver to work. And we didn't want to have custom code in there. So this is how the minimal bootloader looks like. It's literally two files. This is the start. This is literally the zero zero of the um, um, bootloader. Um, and it does basic things like clearing of BSS and then it uh, passes all the parameters that your VTL0 guest kernel passes to the secure kernel, like the number of possible CPUs. Uh, where is the secure kernel memory, the physical memory start? Where does the physical memory end? And what is the total physical address space in the system? Things like that. And it calls into start kernel. And we can look, it's so a start kernel is the second, this is the second file that the bootloader has. And it does, it just builds the boot params and calls into the secure kernel. That is all it does. Nothing else. If you see here, it builds a bunch, it populates a bunch of um, uh, features in the boot param structure, builds the E820 memory structure, builds a simple command line that, and, and, it, and where it passes the number of CPUs, and that's it. It jumps into the secure kernel. Um, at an offset, so that that's important. Like the, so, in the memory space, there is secure loader, and then there is a secure kernel which is loaded at an offset. So it jumps to that offset to start executing the minimal kernel. Okay, so now we actually start booting. So when we started booting, we said that we want we don't want to do SMP first. We'll just bring up a uniprocessor, single boot processor in the system. So we started with config SMP disabled, and the first thing we have to do to a boot is to actually reserve the physical sp memory, the space where the, the secure kernel itself can be loaded. Uh, what we did there is to actually define a command line, new command line parameter called secure kernel, which specifies the size of the physical memory needed by the secure kernel and the address at which it could be loaded. We started with this, and we kind of create an IOMEM resource uh, with this information and we insert it, and which means that the other frameworks in the kernel cannot use, this memory gets reserved and other kernel frameworks do not come in and try to use this memory. Later on, we have extended this to a point where we say that even if this command line parameter is not passed, uh, kernel can actually detect the free space in the physical memory and go ahead and uh, allocate a chunk for the secure kernel depending on the number of CPUs we want to boot in the secure kernel. So this is how right now the boot looks like. We have the guest kernel. It does the init. As part of init, the boot driver is called. The VSM boot driver goes ahead and reserves the secure OS memory. Next step, load the secure kernel. So that is fairly simple. The secure kernel itself, we have put the binaries into the init RD of the, secure, of the guest kernel. So we open the binaries, we read the binaries into buffers and copy it into the secure code, uh, into the reserved memory. That's fairly straightforward right there. Which brings us to this picture, where, and this is how the boot looks like. So now there is a VTL1 memory partition created. Uh, let's suppose, like, let's say we decided to load it at um, 128 MB. That becomes the start of secure loader. and then at a 2 MB offset, we load the Linux kernel, the VM Linux dot bin. The third step here is to, is a very, this is a very Hyper-V specific stuff. So Hyper-V allows you to um, populate the initial context for your CPUs and then send it to Hyper-V to enable VTL1. Usually the step has to be done in the bootloaders. We can avoid it because Hyper-V allows you to do this. So we populate this huge structure with all CPU information like um, RIP, RSP, where the page table information, we build a page, initial page table, uh, populate the important control registers like CR0, CR3, things like that. And then we pass it to the uh, Hyper-V and ask Hyper-V to enable the VTL1 or the secure world for this particular pro CPU. And what this means is whenever this boot CPU switches to secure partition or to the secure world, 
uh, Hyper-V will ensure that all these registers, all these CPU registers are populated with the value we gave in the structure or passed in the structure to the Hyper-V. Again, this is a very Hyper-V specific stuff. Usually this gets done in the bootloader. We could avoid it because Hyper-V gives us the support. And the thing to note here, here, the RIP at this point for CPU zero in that enters VTL1 is set to start of the reserved memory that we have, which is the start of the um, bootloader, the secure bootloader. Okay, and that brings us to this picture where we say that, okay, and other thing I forgot to mention is by the, at this point, we pin the boot process to CPU zero because we want to ensure that from this point, we are booting CPU zero. CPU zero enters VTL one, no other processor enters at this point. So the boot process itself is pinned to boot uh, CPU zero. And finally, we, st we go ahead and issue the call, the VTL call that Anna mentioned, the hyper call to boot uh, CPU zero. We say that, okay, that our, as arguments, we pass the number of possible CPUs, the start location of the memory, the end location of the memory, the total physical memory space. And we issue the VTL call and we ask Hyper-V to switch CPU zero to execute in VTL one. So this is how we proceeded with this. And that brings us to this whole picture here, where we start to boot CPU zero. CPU zero enters um, the secure loader. Secure loader populates the boot params, enters Linux kernel. Linux kernel boots, does all the init process. Uh, there's a VTL1 driver in VTL1 secure OS, calls it. And at the end of init, what Linux kernel does is to go and try to start the init process, process one, right? And we did not have a process one at this point. We have not done anything for process one. We said we disabled file systems. We don't have it. And it crashes at this point. So then what? So then we said, okay, we need a, some minimal init RAM FS at this point, right? So we, there's this GitHub repo written by Christopher, which is called tiny init RAM FS. We pulled it and we did very little modification. The only modification is that the init process kind of comes back into the VTL1 driver that we have. It's an ioctal call. And as part of this ioctal call, we return back to VTL0. That's it. So that brings it, so this is how it kind of looks like. So there is VTL1 now has a small kernel, small user mode, where there is a small init process that runs. It opens the ioctal, returns back, returns to kernel mode, and as part of the ioctal, we jump back to VTL0. And this was supposed to work. And it worked. And this, this was okay. We, we did manage to return back in this picture. But then what happened was that we have tick timer enabled in VTL1. And Anna mentioned that VTL1 always gets the priority. It is at a higher privilege level. If an interrupt comes in VTL1, we get invoked. This control has to go back. The Hyper-V switches the control for CPU0 from VTL0 to VTL1. And we were constantly getting this interrupt storm because of timer. There were two reasons. One is that there is scheduler tick timer that is run turned on, it is running, and which we really did not need. Because for us, we really needed a very quiet system. We needed something like a trusted execution environment, not a whole system with a scheduler and threads and um, all that stuff, right? And the second thing was we were not returning from idle thread. We were returning from this ioctal call from the init process. Idle thread never even got a chance to run. We returned before that. So in that case, what we did was one, one of the things we did was that we did implemented a custom idle thread. Probably this is the little hack, maybe, but, but we, there is support in the kernel to add x86 to define custom x86 idle, and we went ahead and defined a custom x86 idle. Uh, so now what happens is that the init process calls into the ioctal, and the ioctal, instead of returning back into VTL0, what it does is it, que it um, queues this ex custom uh, idle process. It says that change the idle process to this. That this, is, this is the new idle process and this is how I want my idle process to be. And the idle process returns back. Even then, there was jitter because timer still runs. Even if we are in idle thread, timer still runs because for periodic timekeeping and things like that. And it was probably, it, it's not the best. So what we did that for now, we can say we can ignore timekeeping because we don't need it. We just need mem 
we need, a, again, a trusted execution environment. We don't need scheduler. So we went ahead and said, okay, let's suspend ticks for now. And what we, when we come back, we have a quiet system. So we, the local tick on CPU zero is suspended before returning back into VTL zero. And that brings us to this picture here where actually we have a CPU booting in the secure world, running Linux kernel, and coming back into the normal world and staying quiet. It doesn't jitter, it doesn't do anything, it just stays quiet till you invoke it for the second time. You have to explicitly invoke it to enter and exit. Or there has to be an exception. One of the memory policies that we set up or one of the other register policies that we set up has to be violated and there is an explicit interrupt or exception created and then we enter. We do not enter because of timer ticks. With this, I think, yeah, so before, do we have time? Okay, yeah, I think we can do this. Okay. And now we come to this part where we wanted to bring up all the CPUs in the system. So basic logistics again. So we went ahead and re-enabled config underscore SMP. We said, okay, let's do no hertz either. It really didn't matter at this point because we had decided by then we had decided to turn off the ticks. And one important design decision we made at this point was to instead of go with a custom implementation to bring up secondary CPUs because of all this communication between VTL0 and VTL1 is to use the existing hot plug infrastructure in the kernel. So hot plug already allows CPU0 or any CPU in the system to bring up another CPU. So we decided to use that to get CPU0 to bring up all the secondary processors in the system. So that kind of brings us to this two-step process where the first step is to enable VTL1 and set up all the CPU context for secondary CPUs. It's the same as what we did for the primary CPU, just that there's a Hyper-V quirk where it says that for secondary CPUs, this process has to happen from VTL1. And so we went ahead and implemented that. And as part of this, we also said that let us make the kernel running in VTL1 aware of the fact that all these secondary processors exist and they can be present. And that is this arc register CPU call. It's a, it's a kernel, it's a part of the hot plug framework, basically. And that brings us to this picture where, again, CPU zero boots, CPU zero returns, and then CPU zero goes ahead and goes back into VTL1, um, enables VTL1 for each of the secondary processors and registers the CPU, the secondary processor with the hot plug framework and comes back. And finally, we have to boot, we have to go ahead and boot the secondary CPU. So what we did was that at this point, we said that CPU0 will enter the VTL1, it will initiate hot plug for every single secondary processor and then we said, and we went ahead and modified the way, we went ahead and have defined a custom wake up secondary CPU API because that is the API which actually, the wake up secondary CPU is the API which, is, which defines the entry point for your secondary CPUs. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not the entry point, sorry. It, wake up secondary CPUs is the API which is called to invoke the secondary CPUs or to start the boot of the secondary CPUs. Usually that is a NMI or some specific hardware event. But in this case, it cannot be because the secondary CPUs are already running in VTL0. So we, we introduced a custom wake up secondary CPU API where we kind of signal the CPUs running, the secondary CPUs running in VTL0 to come into VTL1 and boot. And once the signal is received, each of the secondary CPUs comes, enters VTL1, boots, and exits. And CPU0, or the boot processor, exits after booting all the secondary CPUs. That brings us to this very complicated picture here, where we say that all this happens, and at the end of it, the boot thread in VTL0 gets unpinned from CPU0. Because we can, at that point, we can say all the CPUs have been brought up in uh, VTL1, and we, don't, we no longer need to ensure that it is only CPU0 that enters VTL1. And I think I will stop there and skip the secure boot part and come to this last slide here because of time. 
So then what is left for us today to implement in this is definitely, we have all this code actually put in a GitHub repo. It is all open source and it is there for everyone to see. And we are planning to upstream most of this code, what, whatever is possible, except the few hacks we have here and there, but we are planning to upstream everything. But we also want to enable a lightweight user process, user space mode in the secure kernel where we want to think of running trustlets and secure apps and things like that. And the, so that is left. And the other thing is in this whole model, we are during the boot, if you think about it, during the boot of a guest kernel, we are going and booting a second kernel. That obviously has to have performance impacts, which we haven't measured. And there will be work that comes out of, there will be optimization and things like that that come out of it. So that is also pending for us. So like I said, all our code is here in the GitHub repo. And that brings us to the end of this talk. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Questions here? Do you want a mic? So, uh, great talk. Uh, so, what's the programming model here? The CPU is hijacked and kept in the higher privilege level until the job is completed before it returns. Uh, and so, when you turn off the timers in the higher privilege level, when you get these trustlets uh, running in user space, you probably want to turn on some timers because they may actually want to know the passage of time. And so, how do you prevent you know, the jitter that will occur uh, on the VTL1 side uh, when, in fact, no work is injected into that environment? So, a couple of things. Okay. We are still thinking of implementing this, right? So there are thoughts. Then nothing is concrete at this stage. So I can talk to you about my thoughts. Uh, one is that there are no hertz options in the kernel. Okay, there is no hertz idle and no hertz full and all that options where, which kind of allows you to suppress ticks to a certain extent, but there is still timekeeping ticks that will happen in the kernel, right? So that is one, we turning those on as one. The other thing we need to think with trustlet is do you, even with trustlets, do you want the secure OS to be the scheduler, right? Today, if you look at Opti is the other secure OS that is very famous and out there in the open. Uh, Opti does not have a scheduler. The scheduling happens from the normal world OS as far as Opti is concerned. So then the question is, when we do this, do we want the benefits? We need to really evaluate the benefit of having scheduling in secure world. Do we want the secure world to schedule or not? Or can we just have the guest OS do the scheduling and secure OS just acts as a, a dummy there. It just acts on the operations that are passed, asked for by the guest kernel. And it implements security policies. Thank you, great presentation. Quick question, how are you, if, if I came up with an application into the security new part, and I want to profile that application. In the secure kernel, do we have profile options that we can read from that perspective, or they are disabled? They are disabled. Okay. okay. I don't know who ha lifted your hands first. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah, yeah, sure. There's a mic. Thank you. So um, you. You briefly mentioned why you didn't you chose uh, Linux as your secure kernel instead of Opti, but uh, now that you've gone through the process of, of you know, disabling the idle timer and, and all of that, and um, I'm, I'm wondering if you still think that the Linux kernel uh, gives you some advantage over Opti. So the advantage the Linux kernel, in my opinion, gives over Opti is not with respect to the framework itself. The biggest problem with Opti was that we did not have x64 support in the main line. If we want to upstream all this, we do not have x64 support in Opti. Okay. And then there is a private implementation of Opti, 
uh, both I think with Intel and even, uh, even at Microsoft for that matter. And those implementations lack SMP support, which is a whole bunch of work on itself and then a maintenance nightmare if you want to maintain it. Do you, do you have more Thank questions? You. No, I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering how this compares to, you know, if you're protecting your environment with the VTL1 model here versus uh, TDX or other kind of hardware-based attestation mode. What can you do with this and not with the other? And, and yeah, what use cases go with each? Sure. Um, so it's slightly different. TDX provides different security guarantees. TDX, its main purpose is to not being able or not needing to trust the hypervisor or the host OS, meaning as a guest, you don't have to, tr to trust those components. For us, the threat model is different. We are trying to protect the guest OS from itself. So we do trust the hypervisor for that and for this implementation, but we do have plans on how to merge those two things together, meaning confidential computing and uh, LVBS, because they are kind of parallel. One is to make sure that you don't trust the hypervisor and maybe the admin and the host OS and all these things. And the other one is to harden the kernel, it's the guest itself. So they do go together. together. Yeah. So how does it work with the live migration on Hyper-B? have not explored it yet. <laughs> that is the answer. <laughs> we have not. We, we, in fact, with this where we are today, there are a bunch of features we do not support. As in, because, just because we are, it is in an evolving state and we are try, still trying to support. As in, with memory protections, what we do is that we say um, all the kernel text and read-only sections uh, get backed up even by the Hyper-V, the protections that we offer, like read-only and read-execute and all, is backed up in the hypervisor. So even if an attacker comes in and wants to change it, he cannot, without going to the secure world and to the hypervisor to change those protections. Similarly, um, the rest of the physical space that doesn't run the kernel or doesn't ho uh, host the read-only data, we mark it as read-write in the hypervisor through the secure OS, basically. And if we want to change permissions there, what we are trying to implement now is that if you want to change permissions in this for things like loading modules, um, things like KXEC, live patching, things like that, uh, we want an authentication to happen from the secure OS before we go ahead and change the memory permissions. As part of that, there's a bunch of features that we have to now disable for this to work, like things like KXEC and live patching and things like that. Mm -hmm. the, so bunch, we haven't reached a full set of features there yet. Just to add on that, I think that when we're doing the live migration, we, may, we should make sure that the protections in the memory are applied to the, where we migrate to. So whenever the, the new kernel is loaded, make sure that the protections are already there. And we also, as part of the migration package, we need to make sure what are the, those memory protections that we have established in previously? So those are applied as is um, to the new one. But those are just thoughts. We <laughs> oh yeah. So previously there are about like three lines of work to like uh, protect the kernel from itself. It's actually the gas kernel. One is like uh, for the secure containers, they make uh, the root FS at read only. And uh, on top of that, they make that layered, uh, like, uh, uh, layered uh, like uh, file systems for like uh, some of them are uh, like uh, red wall layers. And the other lines of work are uh, like uh, 20 years ago, people started with a capability system in the Linux so that they com compartment the Linux system to like, uh, to, to isolate uh, the Linux fu functions from each other. And the third lines of work is like uh, the uh, SEL4. They do a verification of the like uh, the macro kernel or write a unit kernel on top of it, uh, so that and make other like uh, modules as like a uh, loadable. Uh, so like uh, 
they, they will have limited attacking interface to the core kernel where the unikernel stands. So I was wondering like when compared with like when your work compared with like this uh, previous three lines of work, like uh, what, what like what are the differences and what do you think are the unique contributions to the security specifications alignment? Thank you. Okay. So the just to repeat the the question, make sure that I understood it. Um, the question was, how do we compare LVBS with things like unikernels, and maybe some? Uh, could you repeat the the other two? Um, the, the microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, unikernel with verification. The first one, something like SEL four. Uh, second one is a secure container, like mm -hmm. with read-only root FS. The third one is like a capability system in Linux, compartment of Linux code, yeah. Okay, um, so we wanted to start with uh, just the out-of-the-box uh, Ubuntu, let's say, kernel. Um, and so th that was our basis for our guest. Um, I think th those other approaches are slightly different because they make the surface of the guest slightly smaller, meaning that, oh, you have a unikernel that has a smaller interface, you have a container which also has a smaller interface. So those are slightly different. Um, our goal is to make, maybe th those are just slightly different approaches because we start with the guest being just a normal kernel and that can be let's say, uh, run in the cloud. So a customer will have access to that, the whole guest kernel. So our question was, okay, given that, how do we protect it? Um, and that's why we had to go outside of it and use VTL1 in our approach and then the hypervisor in order to apply um, some security protections to it. And I would add that all these other approaches still has this uh, caveat of if the kernel is attacked, if the kernel is compromised, the resources are compromised. The security promises are like, let's say, whatever you say, let's say uh, you can write into text section or you can go and execute whatever you want in the uh, uh, in kernel mode. The, the other, or any of these solutions, because everything, uh, what we are trying to say is that the resources get protected by a higher privilege level at, by hypervisor. So even if your guest is compromised, the resources cannot be attacked. Like the attacker cannot go and let's say write into a read-only data and corrupt it because it is backed by the hypervisor. Um, thank you. I think that we need to uh, wrap up. If you have any additional questions, yeah. uh, please just meet us in the hallway. Yeah, yeah we'll thank be there in the hallway. Thank you.